Let me go ahead and read a little bit about the introduction. And um, Dr. Stanislav Graf um, is a uh, psychiatrist with more than 40 years of experience in research of non-ordinary states of consciousness. In the past, he was principal investigator in a psychedelic research program at the Psychiatric Research Institute in Prague in Czechoslovakia. He was chief of psychiatric research at the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center, assistant professor of psychiatry at the John Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland, and um, scholar in residency at the Esalen Institute in Big Sur, California. Currently, he's professor of psychology at the California Institute of Integral Studies in San Francisco and Pacifica Graduate School in Santa Barbara, where he conducts professional training programs in holotropic breath work and transpersonal psychology and gives lectures and seminars worldwide. He is one of the founders and chief theoreticians of transpersonal psychology and the founding president of the International Transpersonal Association. Among his um, publications are over 100 articles in professional journals in the book Realms of Human Unconscious, The Human Encounter with Death with Joan Halifax, LSE Psychotherapy, Beyond the Brain, The Adventure of Self-Discovery, Beyond Death, The Stormy Search for the Self, the last two with Christina Graf, his uh, wife, uh, The Holotropic Mind, what do we have? Books of the Dead, The Manuals of uh, Dying and Living, The Cosmic Game, and a number of other uh, rich works that he um, has contributed to the uh, um, scientific field of um, non-conscious um, states. And today um, he will talk to us about the psychology of the future, lessons for modern consciousness research. Dr. Graf, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, before I start talking, I would like to thank for the invitation. I really appreciate being here, uh, particularly being here at this very important uh, um, historical moment from my perspective, uh, which is, uh, you know, return to psychedelic research. Um, there is sort of uh, early pilot study, I hope, beginning of uh, many studies that, uh, that will come. Uh, I would like to start in a very unconventional uh, way. Um, and if you find it too personal, just ignore me. I would get away with it in California. I don't know how things are here. <laughs> and please don't raise your hand uh, until I uh, finish the sentence. I would like to ask you, how many of you had in your own life some powerful experiences of non-ordinary states? I don't mean just uh, psychedelic. This could be something that happens in uh, spiritual practice, part of meditation, uh, participation in some uh, native uh, uh, ritual, uh, some powerful form of experiential psychotherapy, uh, uh, powerful experience in hypnosis, near-death experience, or experiences that just happen. You don't ask for it, uh, uh, you might not like it, you don't do anything for it, and it happens anyway. So any of those categories, can I ask you? Quite, quite a few people. That helps because my main focus will be on uh, uh, non-ordinary states of consciousness. Um, usually when I talk uh, for academic audiences, I start with a few biographical anecdotes because many of my colleagues have difficulties understanding how somebody with all the right credentials, you know, background in medicine, in psychology, can take something like spirituality or mysticism seriously and believe that we need something like transpersonal psychology is giving workshops and writing books with funny, uh, somewhat flaky titles like uh, Beyond the Brain or uh, The Cosmic Game or uh, The Stormy Search for the Self. So I would like to just share something from my, from my history so that you understand how something like this can happen. Uh, first of all, I never thought I would be a psychiatrist. I would study medicine. I was much more interested in um, art. I wanted to be in animated movies. And actually, when I was finishing what uh, would be high school here, we call it gymnasium in Europe, um, I already had my interview, and I was supposed to start in the film studios in Prague. 
And just at that time, a friend of mine gave me a, a book, Introductory Lectures to Psychoanalysis by Freud. And uh, I started reading it in the evening. I got so excited I couldn't go to sleep. I read through the night. And within about uh, two days, I decided I would let the animated movies go and I would go study medicine to become a psychoanalyst. I'm sort of mentioning it before because uh, uh, what I will be talking about will take us very far beyond Freudian analysis. I want to sort of uh, somehow describe my initial commitment to Freudian analysis. So I joined a, a group of uh, analysts who were uh, operating in Prague and very shortly after then they had to go underground because of the communist putsch. Uh, I had seven years of uh, Freudian training which was a, a private arrangement between me and my analyst because it would have been dangerous for either of us uh, if somebody uh, knew what we were doing. Uh, I also uh, had absolutely no exposure to uh, religion. And this goes back to a um, uh, major drama in our family. My, my parents met in a small Czech town. Uh, they fell in love. They wanted to get married, but there was a problem because my father's family had no religious affiliation. My mother's family was strictly Catholic, and the local church in this small Czech town refused to marry them because my father was a pagan by their definition. And so there was a major, major problem. It seemed like it, the, the marriage would not happen at all until my grandparents found a, a brilliant solution which was, of course, a major financial donation to the church. <laughs> and then uh, they relaxed their standards, decided to marry a pagan. My grandparents' dream came uh, true, which is they, they had a house on Main Street. They could roll carpets from the house across the street, stop traffic, and sort of continue up the stairs to, to the altar. So the, the guests could go from the altar right into the house. And my parents got so upset, they decided they wouldn't commit me or my brother to any religion. And we should sort of uh, um, make up our own mind when we come of age. And then from this kind of background, which means I, I was not participating in any of the uh, classes in religion that my peers were. And then from this background, I would go to medical school. That, as you know, certainly doesn't cultivate mystical awareness particularly. <laughs> and in addition, I studied medicine in Prague at the time when we had a Marxist regime. So we would get the, really the pure materialist uh, doctrine. So uh, I studied medicine. I uh, became a psychiatrist. And very, very soon I got into a deep conflict about psychoanalysis, which was the reason why I studied, studied uh, psychiatry. And this was the conflict between the, the theory and, and uh, practice of psychoanalysis. I was increasingly excited about the theory, into how many areas psychoanalysis have uh, penetrated and given seemingly brilliant interpretations for all kinds of things. Symbolism of dreams, symptomatology of neurosis, psychopathology of everyday life, uh, uh, religion, content of art, socio-political movements, and so on. So that was very exciting, but then I also became aware of what you can do with psychoanalysis as a practical clinical tool, and that was a whole other story. It was a very narrow indication range. You had to meet very special criteria. And then particularly there was the you know, enormous amount of time, energy, money. My own analysis was over seven years, three times a week, you know, a tremendous commitment. And I had difficulties understanding that. I had a very Freudian uh, orthodox Freudian analyst who used to say psychoanalysis is the science of the human mind. There's nothing it, psychoanalysis cannot explain in that uh, department. There are only things that it hasn't explained yet because there are not the right subjects uh, for the free associations on the couch. And uh, you have to study medicine to become an analyst. And in medicine, you know, if you really understand the problem, you usually can do something fairly dramatic about it. Or if it's an incurable disease, you have a pretty good understanding why you cannot. But here the idea was that we have complete understanding 
and yet we can do so little over such a long period of time. So I became very disappointed. I started kind of nostalgically thinking back about the animated movies. You know, I should have never chosen this uh, <laughs> discipline. Um, and then something very powerful happened in my life. Uh, this was the, uh, the time when uh, there was excitement about psychopharmacology, the early tranquilizers, antidepressants. Um, and we just finished a large study of malarial, uh, which came from Sandoz Pharmaceutical Company. So we had a good working relationship. And as you know, if you have a good relationship with pharmaceutical companies, you get a lot of fringe benefits. So <laughs> they send you free literature. Uh, they might pay your trip to a conference when you report about their uh, preparation. And they also send you a lot of uh, other preparations you know, that they develop. So as part of this cooperation, we got a big box of uh, ampules, and there was a, an insert that came with it. It said this was LSD-25, very interesting investigational substance discovered in the laboratories of Sandus practically by accident by Dr. Hoffman. It was supposed to be a drug for relief of migraine headache and stopping gyne gynecological bleeding and, and sort of fell a little far from the tree. Uh, 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 Dr. Hoffman intoxicated himself uh, accidentally when he synthesized this uh, sample. He found out it had a very powerful psychoactive effect they reported this, gave it to Dr. Stoll, who was the, the son of uh, Dr. Hoffman's boss, the psychiatrist in Zurich. And Dr. Stoll, in 1947, published the first scientific paper on LSD in a group of uh, so-called normal volunteers and psychiatric patients. This became a sensation overnight. And Sandoz now was sending samples to different uh, research institutes, to universities, and also to individual uh, therapists. And they were basically asking, you know, would you work with the substance and let us know if there was any legitimate use uh, for, uh, for LSD. And uh, in the letter, they suggested two possibilities. One was uh, we have a feeling on the basis of the pilot study that um, this uh, drug produces in minuscule dosages of millions of a gram, uh, a state that's very similar to naturally occurring psychosis. So it's possible that psychiatrists, psychologists would have a model here. You could give it to normal people, do all kinds of testing before, during, and after, get some insight about what's happening in the body when these changes in the mind are uh, occurring. and. Uh, it could turn out that schizophrenia and other psychosis would really be chemical problems. They would not be psychiatric problems at all. Uh, the excitement about LSD was not the effect because uh, the, uh, uh, there was already a knowledge of the psychedelic effects of mescaline. Mescaline was studied in the, in the 30s. But the excitement was about the minuscule dosage because it was conceivable that the human body could produce under certain circumstances, small quantities of a similar substance and um, um, be responsible for psychotic phenomena. And the idea was if we can identify the substance, we can find some neutralizing agent and there would be a test tube kind of a solution. Uh, then there was a second point which became uh, something that changed my life. And that was a little note that said, we also feel that maybe this substance could be used as a kind of unconventional training tool for psychiatrists and psychologists and uh, students and nurses. Um, professionals would have the opportunity to spend a few hours in the world of their patients and as a result of it be able to communicate with them better, to understand them better and hopefully to be more effective in their treatment. So. Uh, this was an opportunity I wouldn't have missed for anything in the world. I became one of the early volunteers. And my uh, preceptor who got the substance from uh, Sandoz at the time was interested in EEG. And he was also interested at the time in what's called driving the brain waves, exposing people to different acoustic and optical frequencies and studying in the corresponding areas of the brain if uh, entrainment happens, if the brain waves will pick up the frequency that is being fed. 
So uh, those of us who wanted the LSD experience had to agree to have not only the EEG done, but also our brainwaves driven sort of before, during, and after. It looked uh, practically was that between the second and the third hour when my experience was culminating, a research assistant came and said it was time to drive the brain waves. So she took me to a little cell, uh, I lay down, she pasted the electrodes on my head, asked me to close my eyes and then brought this gigantic strobe, put it above my head and turned this thing on. And in the next moment there was light like I had never seen in my life, couldn't even imagine existed. Um, my first idea was this must have been like what it looked like in Hiroshima when the bomb went off. Today I think it was more like the Dharmakaya, the, the primary clear light from the Tibetan Book of the Dead that we're supposed to see at the moment of death. Uh, my consciousness was catapulted out of the body, I lost the connection with the body, I lost the research assistant, I lost the clinic, I lost Prague, then I lost the planet, and then I had the feeling my consciousness had absolutely no boundaries. Uh, and when, as she was following very carefully the protocol, you know, going from, from two cycles to 60, back, then leaving it for a while in the middle of the alpha, then the theta, then uh, the delta uh, range, and then she turned it off. And as she was doing it, I had this you know, incredible uh, cosmic type of experience of cosmic consciousness. And then when she turned it off, uh, my consciousness started to shrink again. I found the planet, I found Prague, I found my body. And after a while, I managed to align my consciousness uh, with my body again. And I was very impressed what just had happened to me. <laughs> and I thought, well, I thought I'm stuck with psychiatry, so this by far is the most interesting thing you can do when you're a psychiatrist, study non-ordinary states of consciousness. So for the last, it's now 45 years, I have really done very little else professionally, but something that was in one way or another related to these non-ordinary states. Uh, about half of the time uh, was clinical research with psychedelics in the research institute in Prague and then at uh, the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center where for a few years I was heading the last surviving uh, psychedelic research in the United States. Uh, the second half, uh, my wife Christina and I developed the holotropic breathwork where you can induce powerful non-ordinary states using very simple means like faster breathing, some evocative uh, music and a certain kind of body work. I had a lot of contact with anthropologists. Uh, I spent some time with shamans. I participated in uh, various ceremonies of uh, native uh, cultures uh, in, with peyote, with uh, mushrooms, with uh, uh, ayahuasca. Uh, I did some work with people who had near-death experiences. We also had one of the studies we did at the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center was work with people uh, who had terminal cancer facing death. Um, so working with people with near-death experiences uh, and having contact with uh, thanatologists, uh, doing some work with people with UFO abduction experiences, some of the people studying, uh, uh, these kinds of uh, experiences in contact with some uh, spiritual teachers, you know, Siddha Yoga, the uh, people of the Benedictine uh, order, uh, some Zen Buddhists and so on. So all these things uh, also work with people who had spontaneous uh, uh, episodes of what we call spiritual emergencies, but basically psychotic states with a lot of spiritual, uh, spiritual contact, content. Um, so I uh, published a, a number of books uh, about it because during this work there, was, uh, there were many challenging experiences and many challenging uh, observations. Uh, uh, quite a few of them could not be somehow interpreted in terms of the kind of training that I got in uh, medicine, in psychiatry, and in, in psychoanalysis. So I wrote books on the different aspects of these observations. And quite a few of them have been published by State University New York Press. And then um, about three years ago, I got a letter from them that said, we published several of your books. 
would you consider writing one book in which you would kind of summarize the observations from this work and uh, specify somehow the conceptual challenges, the kinds of observations and experiences that cannot be accounted for in terms of the psychiatry and psychology that we have uh, in the West? And would you also suggest what kind of revisions would have to be made in uh, psychiatry and psychology to accommodate these kinds of experiences? And I was just approaching uh, 70 and uh, told myself that I would sort of uh, at least partially retire uh, and pass the training to some other people. So we needed a, a manual for the training. And so this was a very welcome opportunity to get the manual for our training published by SUNY Press. So I wrote a book uh, and I gave it a kind of deliberately challenging title, uh, Psychology of the Future expressing my really strong belief that if we systematically study the kind of observations and the experiences in these non-ordinary states, that it would radically change psychology and psychiatry to the extent that it would resemble what happened to physicists in the third decade, that we would somehow catch up with the change in the worldview that happened in quantum relativistic uh, physics and the kind of things that are outlined in what's, what has been called the new paradigm thinking. So this is uh, something that I would like to share with you. And I'm um, uh, very well aware that it's going to be very provocative for, for uh, some of you. I have a, a less than an hour to communicate something that took me years to accept uh, when I was experiencing it and I was with people who were experiencing it. So those are really major, major uh, challenges, conceptual challenges. So I wouldn't expect that it, you know, it would be easily acceptable. But, uh, the exciting thing is that you're going to have uh, psilocybin research here, so you hopefully will observe some of the things uh, yourself, and you'll be able to, to say whether or not uh, you see it in a similar way. So I have studied non-ordinary states of consciousness. Uh, and the first problem was semantic. You know that in psychiatry, most psychiatrists today use the term altered states, which I cannot stand now after years of consciousness research. Uh, and I always have to think about uh, veterinary medicine when I hear it, uh, you know, when you get your dog altered. Uh, so, because the, the idea is that uh, we should experience ourselves and the world in a particular way, and that these states are, uh, these altered states are kind of a distortion of what it should be that they start kind of bastardized versions. Uh, uh, whereas I came to the conclusion that they are healing, they are transformative, they are uh, evolutionary. And um, um, you know that they uh, open up dimensions of reality which are ontogenically, ontogenetically real or some kind of interesting, radically different perspective on everyday uh, reality. So we prefer, those of us who've done some uh, consciousness research prefer that term non-ordinary. But there's also a problem with that because that still covers a very large, you know, what is non-ordinary state of consciousness. You can get drunk and certainly be in a non-ordinary state of consciousness. You might learn a lesson or two, but it's not <laughs> going to be very healing or transformative or revealing. Uh, organic psych uh, psychosis, uh, trivial delirium, they're all, all non-ordinary altered states, but they are not the kind of category I was interested in. I was interested in the types of experiences that I ask you about when I asked the question, did you have any of those experiences? And I was just astounded that in psychiatry we don't have any special name for that category of experiences. We call them all altered states of consciousness. And basically seeing them in the, the category of pathology, not having any positive uh, use uh, for them. So I decided to give them a name, and I call them holotropic. Uh, holos means whole, and uh, trap, uh, tropic is derived from trepane, which means moving towards or being oriented towards. So it literally means moving toward wholeness or being oriented towards wholeness. Uh, now, what uh, it would mean that we somehow are not whole the way we are. Uh, so 
the basic uh, idea behind this term is that we identify with just with fraction of who we are in the ordinary state of consciousness. Um, I usually uh, use a kind of Hindu shorthand uh, referring to the Upanishads when the question, who am I, is answered by tatvam asi, which in Sanskrit means you are it or thou are that. You are not nama rupa, you are not name and shape, you are not the body ego. You have a larger identity, which is with the creative principle in the universe, with the creative energy of the universe, the Hindu term being Atman Brahman uh, for that. Uh, now, this is not a philosophical speculation. This is something that uh, can be pragmatically uh, tested. And in non-ordinary states, you can have the experiences of your boundaries melting and you, your consciousness expanding so that it encompasses much larger uh, units, becoming other people, experiencing group consciousness, experiencing identification with various uh, animal species, identification with uh, archetypal beings, visits to archetypal domains, and so on. And there's also a very significant experience in which you can uh, have a sense of becoming the divine, becoming the creative principle itself, the experience of uh, Brahman, the Tao, the great spirit, the cosmic Christ, um, you know, whatever the name is in different spiritual uh, uh, traditions. So this is the term, holotropic, it means that these states somehow can take us step by step, sometimes smaller steps, sometimes bigger steps, to uh, the reclaiming of our sort of cosmic identity, of our larger, uh, larger uh, identity. And as you know, wholeness is also related to healing. There is a healing that seems to be happening in this process of melting the, uh, of the boundaries if the states are properly integrated. Uh, so what's the difference between uh, these holotropic states and the other non-ordinary states or the altered states? Uh, First of all, if you have a trivial delirium, if you have a psychotic, uh, uh, organic psychotic state, there's usually disorientation in terms of person, place, time. People might not know who they are, where they are, what's happening, what year it is. There is impairment of the intellect. There is uh, um, amnesia uh, after those states and so on. None of it happens in this holotropic variety. Here, the change of consciousness is very profound, but also very, very subtle. He still remains sort of connected with this reality. We can operate. We know where there are bathrooms or that there are bathrooms. And uh, we know where we are. We know who we are. With the exception of spiritual emergency, we know why we are in that state. We're just in a shamanic ritual, or we are, uh, we have just taken uh, some psychedelic, or we are doing a holotropic, a holotropic uh, workshop. So we know we are still in touch with uh, the everyday reality, but at the same time, another reality or realities are invading our field of consciousness. So we would have each foot in a different reality. Uh, Eugene Bloiler, when he was describing uh, psychosis, he uh, referred to it as uh, double bookkeeping, doppelte uh, Buchführung in uh, German, you know, to be in two realities at the same time. Uh, another characteristic of uh, the holotropic state would be a powerful emotions that cover a much wider range than what we experience in everyday life, where uh, the extremes are the extremes that have been described in spiritual religious literature. For example, on one side you can have uh, ecstatic uh, rapture. You can have a state of uh, bliss, of you know, peace that passes all understanding, uh, celestial, paradisian kind of states. On the other side, there could be hellish state. There could be abysmal despair. There could be tremendous uh, uh, anxiety. There could be profound feelings of guilt. And then anything in between. Uh, the intellect is uh, changed in a very interesting way. It's not impaired in holotropic states, unlike in the trivial uh, deliria. The intellect functions in a, in a fundamentally different way. So there are certain situations for which the holotropic changes uh, 
and intellectual, uh, intellectual functioning are not great. Yeah, I wouldn't like to be in a holotropic state when I have to do my taxes, for example. <laughs> Uh, or it's not good for driving the car. If you are a pilot landing a 747, you want to be in a different kind of state of consciousness. Uh, I call that state hylotropic. Hila means matter, trapein again moving towards. So it's matter-oriented consciousness, which is the everyday consciousness in which we experience ourselves as Newtonian objects living in a Newtonian world where space is three-dimensional, time is linear, uh, everything's connected with chains of cause and effect and so on. Landing a 747, you want to know that you can trust that the runway is solid and that you have certain, uh, you know, fixed space-time coordinates. This is not a good time to explore your past life in ancient Egypt. This is not a good time to have an out-of-body experience to San Francisco. You really want to be in the situation. On the other hand, if you spend your life just in the hylotropic state, it's very difficult to find any meaning in life. You're a piece of flesh going from conception to death. Whatever you create sooner or later is going to be destroyed. You're going to get old and die. Uh, you know, you spend your life like uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger pumping iron, and then at the end there is a senile marism, or like myself, spending hundreds or thousands of hours uh, in libraries reading books and then realizing that at the end I won't be able to remember what I had for dinner last night. So, <laughs> so there's a sense of futility in that kind of a so-called normal worldview in, in Western civilization. So you have to transcend that. Uh, and that comes in the, the deeper meaning comes in the, in the holotropic uh, states. So if we want to find deeper meaning in life, if we want to do healing, not body mechanics, we can do very good body mechanics in the holotropic state, but healing always happens in a, in a holotropic state. If you look at the healing ceremonies of, uh, of uh, shamans or of uh, native cultures and so on, those always involve uh, the healing potential of these, uh, of these holotropic uh, states. If we want to tap deeper sources of inspiration, Again, we can do a good job uh, in the hylotropic state, but some of the major breakthroughs, paradigm-changing breakthroughs, usually come in holotropic states. There's a very interesting book by Willis Harmon, the former president of the Institute of Noetic Sciences, called Higher Creativity. We have a tremendous list of situations in which major scientific breakthroughs uh, uh, you know, religious inspiration, uh, uh, artistic inspiration came through non-ordinary states. You know the Kekule uh, example, which was the beginning of organic uh, chemistry, the, the idea of the benzene, benzene ring. You know the story? Yeah. Uh, Mozart said that whole fa uh, symphonies appeared in his head in a, in a finished uh, form. Um, Puccini said he didn't write Madame Butterfly, it was God who wrote it. He was just holding the pen, it just sort of uh, came through. Uh, ideas for Nobel Prize winning projects, you know, came from, from these kinds of non-ordinary states, uh, including discoveries in, in uh, quantum physics and so on. Einstein's uh, discovery of theory of relativity and so on. Uh, also, if we want to cultivate intuition, if we want to cultivate uh, extrasensory perception, that would be happening in, uh, in the holotropic states. So the intellect functions in a, in a very different way. We can, for example, have the experience of becoming uh, an animal, identifying with an animal, and we can find new information about that animal, uh, which goes way beyond anything that we have learned in this uh, lifetime. So, and, and completely uh, uh, different way of getting to know the universe, it becomes available in a non-ordinary state. Usually we use our senses, we observe, we analyze, we synthesize. In a non-ordinary state, we learn by becoming something, by becoming animals, by becoming other people, uh, you know, by uh, uh, becoming part of a mythology. Jung, you know, had the concept of collective unconscious because he saw that in um, psychiatric patients, uh, mythologies of other cultures can come through, cultures that they have never studied, that they didn't even know 
existed. So the whole idea of the uh, collective unconscious in its archetypal mythological way comes from these uh, non-ordinary states. There are also powerful physical uh, manifestations. Again, a big spectrum where on one side there could be a sense of incredible uh, well-being, uh, you know, physical vitality, uh, uh, enormous amount of energy that becomes uh, available. And the other side of the spectrum, we can experience ourselves as uh, as dying, or we can experience, you know, extreme uh, pains. We can experience suffocation when we are reliving uh, birth, and so on. So those are the. This is the phenomenology of these holotropic states. Now there are many ways we can induce them. We had about five years ago we had a conference of the International Transpersonal Association in Manaus, which was called Technologies of the Sacred, Ancient, Aboriginal, and Modern, where we were exploring experientially and intellectually different ways of inducing these holotropic states. So there were shamans from different South American states. There were the Santo Daime people who work with ayahuasca, the Unio de Vegetal people who also work with uh, uh, ayahuasca. Uh, there were the, the spiritists, there were the Umbanda people. We did a large uh, holotropic breathwork pre-conference uh, workshop, uh, you know, Jungians uh, talking about active imagination and so on. So there are many, many of these uh, techniques, some of them developed by shamans, by uh, native cultures, uh, using uh, drumming, uh, rattling, uh, work with sticks, gongs, uh, bells, uh, fasting, extreme physical pain, uh, dancing, drumming, uh, things involving breathing, uh, psychedelic plants, and so on. And they all have been used in different combinations as part of ritual and spiritual life. Obviously, we would not have religions if it were not for these holotropic states. You know, at the beginning, at the cradle of all major religions, were visionary experiences of the prophets, of the saints, uh, uh, of the founders of the religion, and also of the early uh, uh, disciples. So um, religion began from visionary experiences. Now when it becomes an organized religion, that's a whole other story. Very frequently the religion loses the connection to the spiritual source and becomes uh, involved in politics, in secular things, concerned about controlling people, possessions, uh, hierarchies, and so on. So there's a major difference between spirituality, which is a direct um, experience of these uh, normally invisible dimensions of, of reality, which is a very private thing, it's between me and the universe, and based on personal experience, and then there is religion. Not everything that's religious is spiritual, not everything that's spiritual is uh, religious. So this is related, what I'm discussing is related to spirituality. And that is found primarily in the mystical branches of the religions or in the monastic branches where people actually do practice. They fast, they are sleep deprived, they, they meditate, they, they pray and so on. Uh, Religion frequently doesn't involve any non-ordinary experiences. If in today's church somebody would have really a full-blown mystical experience, your average priest probably calls the, the ambulance and uh, would think that that kind of thing doesn't, doesn't belong to church. It's, it's okay to talk about what happened to people 2,000 years ago, but those experiences today are not uh, acceptable. There's the psychiatrists kind of in cahoots with uh, mainstream religions. If they agree on, uh, on that. So um, those are the, the ancient uh, methods, the aboriginal methods, and then of course we have a number of methods now contributed by modern psychiatry. You now we have isolated most of the alkaloids from the, from the plants. We have mescaline, we have uh, uh, psilocybin, psilocine, we have uh, the tryptamine derivatives, we have the, the THC uh, from uh, cannabinol and so on. We've also experimented with not only sleep deprivation, but also dream deprivation, lucid dreaming. Uh, we have experimented with uh, sensory uh, isolation, sensory uh, deprivation. Uh, some professionals develop uh, kinesthetic devices like uh, Avram Kaufman's rotating couch. Uh, um, 
Gene Houston and Bob Masters uh, recreated the witch's cradle that the, that the medieval witches used to get into a trance state and so on. So this is a, there's a large spectrum of these uh, um, methods of inducing these, uh, these uh, experiences. Now there's a tremendous difference between the industrial civilization and all the pre-industrial cultures, the ancient and pre-industrial native cultures. Uh, difference in worldview. Now obviously we know much more about the material world than these cultures ever knew. You know, we have, uh, in terms of technology, understanding of material processes, there's no comparison. But that's not surprising. You wouldn't expect that after hundreds of years of uh, accumulation of information, you know, uh, we have books where we can pass information. So uh, in that sense, uh, it's not surprising. But there is another difference which is surprising, and which is in regard to the spiritual dimension. All the ancient and aboriginal cultures, without exception, believe that there are dimensions of reality that are ordinarily uh, invisible. They believe that consciousness, in some sense, is superior to matter, that consciousness does not end uh, with death. There is posthumous journey. There are these different abodes of the uh, uh, blessed and the doomed and so on. Uh, there's reincarnation, uh, metempsychosis and so on. Whereas for the Western industrial civilization, at least for, the, for its sort of main spokesman, uh, this is a material universe. The, the history of the universe is the history of developing matter. Much of it happened without any participation of consciousness, without any participation of creative intelligence. It happened in a very small, infinitesimal part of the universe after billions of years of development that a life uh, originated. And then within life, then consciousness as the epiphenomenon of the neurophysiological processes in the brain, and then uh, intelligence. So in that kind of worldview, there's absolutely no place for, for spirit. So to be spiritual from a strictly materialistic psychiatric perspective is to be primitive, to be uneducated, to be uh, gullible, to be into primitive thinking, uh, primary a process. Now, if it happens to somebody who's intelligent, like people like in the category of Einstein or uh, uh, Bohr and so on, uh, the idea is uh, you probably have some unfinished business from your childhood. You have you are carrying some kind of infantile images of your of your parents, and you're projecting it out there and making sort of gods and goddesses uh, out of them. And when somebody has spiritual experiences, then uh, we, we give them diagnosis and we put them on uh, tranquilizers. Uh, so um, there is a, there's a fundamental difference between these two groups of people, all the pre-industrial cultures and the industrial civilization in relation to spirituality. Now the usual uh, interpretation is that they didn't have science. We have, we have sort of superior materialistic uh, scientific understanding. Um, the way I would see it after working 45 years with these states is that it has something to do with the relationship with these holotropic states. That All these pre-industrial and ancient cultures held these states in very high esteem. They spent a lot of time and energy developing powerful and effective and safe ways of, of inducing them and they were regularly practicing them. So they were having their sort of everyday maintenance activities, and then once in a while they would have a ritual where a group of people or the whole tribe would go into a non-ordinary state, and they would experience these kinds of states, holotropic states that I'm talking about, and they're so powerful, so convincing, that once you have them, you have to build them into your worldview. There's no way, no way you, can, you can ignore that kind of experience. We like talking me out of uh, the fact that there is a microphone here. I mean, I can see it, you know, I have a very real experience. So if people have past life experiences or they have experience of the divine, just, uh, uh, encountering archetypal beings, mythological beings, those are very, very powerful uh, types of uh, experiences. So I see the difference now being based on the naivete of the industrial civilization in relation to 
these holotropic states. While the native cultures all were using them all through their life, and uh, they combined in their worldview the experience from the hylotropic and the holotropic, we have eliminated this holotropic dimension out of our life. We discourage uh, these kinds of experiences. We have even outlawed some of the means and some of the contexts. And when people have spontaneous experiences, we consider it to be a pathology across the board and we suppress them. So we don't have information coming from that domain. Harner, who is a, how are we doing? Uh, Michael Harner, who is uh, a well-known anthropologist, but also somebody who experienced initiation when he was doing field work in the Amazon, which involved ayahuasca and datura and mixture. He wrote a book called uh, The Way of the Shaman. And in the preface, he wrote something very interesting. He said that from his dual perspective of a Western-trained academician and also somebody who personally experienced uh, the shamanic initiation, that Western psychology and psychiatry is seriously biased in at least two significant ways. The first bias he calls um, the uh, ethnocentric bias. You see, we have certain kind of perspective on the psyche and what is normal, what isn't normal. Uh, and we consider that perspective to be absolutely superior to any human group that has ever existed. We have it really together. All these other cultures are primitive. They are sort of uh, uneducated. What they are doing uh, has, has no uh, basis. Um, when I had talked to Michael, for example, about the Middle Eastern war in the, in the past, you know, there was a situation, uh, 200,000 people, you know, killed in a way that looked like a sort of uh, computer game. Uh, 600 oil wells deliberately uh, ignited, uh, oil spills, deliberate oil spills into the Persian Gulf, uh, killing the life for the next 20 years. We all watch it on the television. It's just another day in the Western civilization. If somebody has a past life experience, we think we should put them away and put them on uh, tranquilizers. So this is what, what Michael calls ethnocentric. Different cultural groups have different concepts of what is acceptable, what is not, what is not uh, acceptable. Uh, now the second uh, bias uh, that he talks about is more interesting from the perspective of my talk. He calls it cognicentric. A probably better term is pragmacentric, which means we have created uh, the theories in psychology and psychiatry on the basis of observations uh, from ordinary states and, and uh, experiences of, from non-ordinary states of consciousness. We have systematically excluded somehow from scrutiny, from systematic scrutiny, anything that comes from the study of these experiences that I call holotropic. I'm not talking just about uh, psychedelic literature. A lot of things were published that were ignored by the, by the uh, mainstream circles. Um, but things coming from field uh, anthropology, uh, things coming from experiential uh, psychotherapy, uh, um, and from thanatology. I will give you just that example from, from thanatology. It's uh, well known today that uh, you can be in a state of uh, near death. You have a near death experience, let's say cardiac arrest, and your consciousness leaves the body while you're being resuscitated. Consciousness moves in the room, maintaining the, the perceptual capacity, can watch the whole procedure from, from the ceiling, can decide to go and check what's happening in other rooms uh, of the same building, going through walls, uh, can experience something that's happening 200 miles away. And if uh, the person is brought back to life and you talk with them, you get the report, you can then go and check and you'll find out that you get consensual validation that those things were actually happening. The last study was very interesting. Ken Ring studied a group of people congenitally blind who at the time when they had near-death experience, they could see for the first time in their life 
and he was particularly interested in what he calls veridical uh, out-of-body experiences, where they not only saw something, but what they saw, again, could be consensually validated. Now, this is a major paradigm challenge. I mean, the, you know, the modern physicists needed much less to move from, uh, from Newtonian physics to, to uh, uh, quantum relativistic uh, physics. So if you work with non ordinary states, you will see many things like this. I just give it as one example, but we see many, many of uh, those kinds of things that should not be happening if the way we are describing the relationship between uh, the brain and uh, consciousness is really uh, accurate. Okay, okay so... Um, I will just show you in which areas I believe we would have to change somehow uh, our belief system in order to, uh, to uh, accommodate these experiences. Am I doing something wrong? It's coming, yeah, okay. <laughs> So this is the list that I have in my book of, of uh, areas uh, of belief that we uh, have, you know, at least the official, the, the official kind of a party line in psychology and psychiatry that are seriously challenged by the observations uh, from non-ordinary states. The first one is the cartography of uh, the, uh, the psyche. We have... Is there any way I can, I can at least see people a little? Um, so we have, we have a cartography of the psyche that's limited to postnatal biography and to the Freudian uh, individual unconscious. If you work with non-ordinary states, people's experiences will not stay within that playground. Uh, so when I tried to, after years of research, I tried to map somehow the experiences that were common in psychedelic sessions, I had to vastly expand that cartography and include two domains. Uh, the first of them I call perinatal, because many, many people in non-ordinary states are actually reliving their birth, and they get access to prenatal kind of experiences. Uh, now, it's extraordinary, if you think about it, that we don't think generally about birth as being a psychotrauma, something that could last 20, 30, 40 hours. Uh, the child can be born half dead or dead and has to be resuscitated. This is not considered to be a psychotrauma, but we put tremendous emphasis on the immediately following experience of nursing, good breast, bad breast, you know, good mother, uh, good nipple, evil nipple, wrong nipple, and so on. So if the child didn't notice that something strange was happening when uh, he or she was being born, it will take a very long time before they can sort of distinguish nuances in uh, nursing. And this, this kind of work shows you that there is a powerful imprint of, of the birth process. So the perinatal area has to be added, and then there is a vast uh, realm beyond that which we now call transpersonal. Some of the experiences I mentioned, we can identify with other people, we can experience group consciousness, we can experience identification with animal forms where new information is, is coming uh, in, identification with nature. We can transcend linear time, we can have experiences from the lives of ans our ancestors. There's a whole important category of karmic uh, experiences. Uh, ancestral experiences, uh, the collective uh, unconscious uh, in the historical sense, the way Jung described it. But there's also uh, access there to the uh, archetypal, to the mythological dimension of the collective unconscious. We can experience <laughs> deities from different cultures, again, whether or not we know this <coughs> mythology. So the cartography has to be vastly uh, expanded. Now, in terms of the understanding of emotional and psychosomatic disorders, which are not organic, which are what we call functional or psychogenic, again, the, the general understanding is that you can fully explain them from postnatal events, what happened in infancy, what happened in, 
childhood and what happened uh, later in life. It's all sort of Freudian idea of the oral, anal, uh, urethral, and so on. Uh, phallic, uh, early cannibalism, you know, electra complex. This should be uh, our conceptual equipment that fully accounts for what we see as functional and psychogenic disorders. If you work with non-ordinary states, people who have these problems, you always get something significant from childhood and infancy that seems to give an explanation, but it is not a full story. Then you find out that the same problem has deeper roots on the perinatal and then typically even into the, into the transpersonal. So let's say you can work with somebody who has psychogenic asthma. In the holotropic breathwork, if the per person would be, the holotropic breathwork would intensify the, the choking. There would be choking and then the first experience that comes connected with the choking would be, let's say, near drowning when the person was seven. Then it continues, goes deeper, it becomes a series of episodes when the older brother was, was uh, choking that person. Then it goes to whooping cough. Then a deeper layer would be choking in the birth canal. And then you can get a past life experience of being hanged or being strangled. So that is a whole, what I call a coex system, a system of, of condensed experience. So the, if we get the, the biographical part of the story, it seems to make sense, but it would not be the whole story. It would not have the kind of therapeutic impact that we would expect because there is much more uh, underneath. So we would have an expanded uh, view of what is the material underlying a typical emotional or psychosomatic problem. Now, this looks like very bad news. There's much more there than we thought. But the good news is that you also find new, very powerful, effective mechanisms in, of healing in non-ordinary states. Let's say reliving birth and integrating that experience can be extremely healing and transformative. Uh, I have seen powerful healing happening in connection with uh, past life experience. Again, whatever we think about reincarnation, the past life experience as a phenomenon is a very real thing, however we decide to uh, <coughs> interpret it. Uh, I have seen situations where the healing happens when a powerful archetype, Jungian archetype, is allowed to, to surface into consciousness. Powerful healing can happen when people have um, experience of uh, cosmic unity, sort of oneness, dis dissolving of boundaries and so on. So we find many, many new effective therapeutic mechanisms. Uh, then we have the, the strategy of psychotherapy. Now if you think about it, we have enormous number of schools of, of psychotherapy. And they have fundamental disagreement as to what, how the psyche functions, what are the major motivating uh, forces in the psyche, why symptoms develop, what the symptoms mean, and each therapeutic school gives you a different technique that we use to work with the clients. So if I'm a beginning psychiatrist, I look at the market, and then one school starts talking to me. Like for me, it was Freud. Wow, this is where it's at. And then if we are there for a while and it doesn't work for us, we get a training in another school, and there could be a fundamental disagreement between those schools. Uh, now, this can, cannot be an important factor because if the conceptual understanding would be a major factor, then one school would have to have be closest to truth, and that school would have to get most of the therapeutic results. But the studies that were done show that the therapeutic results are almost equally distributed, and each school has good therapists and bad therapists, and doesn't seem to have a lot of convincing relationship with what uh, the theoretical concept is, what we think we are doing. So some of the studies emphasize that maybe what's important in psychotherapy is the quality of the human encounter between the therapist and the client, or the feeling of the client of being unconditionally accepted by another human being, sometimes for the first time in their life. And the, the kind of interpretation that we give cannot be the significant part because that would vary. The interpretation of the same material would vary from school to school. I usually remember something from my own uh, psychoanalysis. I had a uh, psychoanalyst who was a kind of elderly gentleman. He was elderly. He was probably my age now. Uh, uh, and he was, as I mentioned, he was really convinced Freudian. 
and several of us of the same age were in analysis with him and uh, once in a while he would fall asleep kind of, uh, in analysis and we would have to do something to try, him, try to bring him back into the process. And then besides having our own training, we also had uh, seminars where we could ask questions. And so on one occasion, one of us asked a purely theoretical question, what happens when a psychoanalyst falls asleep? If I continue free associating, does therapy still continue? Is this an interruption of the therapeutic process? Uh, uh, should I get refunded for the <laughs> period of time when the analyst is dozing off? And uh, so he had to answer it. He couldn't say it wouldn't happen because he knew we knew, so he had to come up with an <laughs> interpretation of some kind. So he said, yeah, that happens. You know, sometimes you're kind of tired or you're recovering from a flu, so it happens. But when you are in this business for a long time, you develop a kind of sixth sense. You fall asleep only when the stuff that's coming up is irrelevant. <laughs> he was also, he knew a lot about Pavlov, so he gave Pav Pavlov's example of the waking point, when you have the cortical inhibition, the waking point, and Pavlov's uh, example is a mother who can sleep through heavy noises, but when the child starts moaning, you, you know, she wakes up, it's right there, so it's, it's just like the mother, you know, you, you just wake up and you're right there. So then I realized there was a problem, because uh, what is relevant, what isn't relevant, it, it's depends on the kind of training you have, depend on the school, what's relevant for a Freudian is not necessarily uh, relevant for a Jungian or for somebody who's trained by Karen Horney and so on. So, interesting thing that happens, we discover a, an alternative, which is working with the healing intelligence of the client himself or herself. In a non-ordinary state, you mobilize this uh, healing intelligence that finds the areas in the psyche that have the strongest emotional charge that are also available at the time for processing and in a non-ordinary state that would become the content of the experience. So it starts spontaneously surfacing and then in the experience that the symptom is consumed uh, because it's transformed into a stream of experiences. Some of them biographical, some of them perinatal, some of them uh, transpersonal. Okay. Uh, now, the other area where we would have to fundamentally change our position is in relation to spirituality. Spirituality is something that's pathological, something that uh, you know, a mature person should not uh, get involved in. Uh, now, I'm making a major dis uh, distinction between religion and spirituality. Spirituality is based on these direct experiences of these, uh, uh, what I believe are ontologically real perspectives of the, of the collective unconscious, uh, uh, of the perinatal unconscious and so on. Uh, so spirituality, as Jung suggested, has something to do with the depths to which we experience ourselves when our process of self-exploration reaches at least the perinatal level, the experiences would get a quality that Jung called numinosity. They become numinous, uh, which means we have a direct experience of being in a realm that uh, belongs to a higher order, a realm that's, that's radically different from, from this, and there's a direct experience of this realm being supraordinated to what is happening here, like the, the realm of the archetypes, for example and so on. Uh, so no matter how the original spiritual experiences were distorted in the history of religion, developing into all kinds of pathologies and so on, you know, religion could not have the role in the history of humanity if it were not related to something that's really basic and relevant in the, in the uh, human psyche. And, uh, what I didn't say before when I talked to Michael Harner is that I have heard, worked with hundreds of people who had the best uh, credentials you can imagine, the good IQs and the, you know, train, specific training, when they had the chance to have these transpersonal